Yeah, many thanks he, you for the introduction and Andrea for inviting me here. Um, I will not talk directly about Andrea's works, but I will try to give a kind of general framework uh, from which um, we might consider the work or the whole idea, trajectory of institutional critique in a slightly different way. Uh, and that has uh, to do simply with the fact that my own recent work is mainly focused on a sort of conceptual history, uh, a reconstruction of theoretical and political models of thought and pos positioning, which um, I think, and I'm convinced they still you know, are valued and it's worth to reconsider them uh, because they inspire, seem to inspire contemporary artistic practices. <laughs> Um, I hope, however, that already by the second half of the talk, the relation to Andrea's work will be come clear, and we can talk about it more specifically in the discussion. So the title of my talk is Showing Nothing, the Ethics of Institutional Critique. I will show, however, something, namely a painting by Henri Rousseau, which you see uh, on the screen. It is from 1892. Um, made at the occasion of the anniversary of the foundation of the first French Republic in 1792. This painting, it is called the Carmagnole, which is a dance from southern France. The Carmagnole, a century of independence, obviously does not show nothing. And that would be very difficult to do for a painting anyhow. Yeah, I mean, it Maybe the phrase showing nothing inspired some kind of modernist uh, way of painting, but that's for sure not the case here. But what it shows um, is precisely showing nothing. Yeah? Um, uh, obviously it shows something, and what it shows is showing nothing. And I will try to explain what I mean with that uh, slightly paradoxical phrase. So on the level of its manifest content, the painting shows a revolutionary feast. Young men and women wearing Phrygian caps, yeah, the red caps, red revolutionary caps, and dancing in front of a tree while the elder ones are standing on the sides watching them. The two women in the center next to the tree represent the first and the second republic. Yeah, the second republic went from 1848. Henri Rousseau might have seen this scene or a similar scene as a sort of historical reenactment and thus tried to prove his republican commitment and to give it a vivid, colorful expression yeah, with all the flags and this kind of naive yeah, uh, way of painting. The scene itself, however, is not just an ephemeral or accidental event from late 19th century everyday life within the Third Republic, yeah, Henri Rousseau's own context, rather it contains the crucial therapeutical fantasy of what institutional critique is about. As such, yeah, and that is the crucial point for me, that it uh, contains the crucial therapeutical fantasy of what institutional critique is about, it refers to the other Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who indeed is the founder of institutional critique as we know it and who has described precisely that scene twice in his early work. It is from here that the revolutionaries in the 1790s took it in order to transform it into a pagan republican ritual. Interestingly enough, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's two, two descriptions of the scene differ fundamentally in terms of its evaluation. The first one stems from the so-called second discourse, that is the discourse, that's one of his early books, yeah, the discourse about the origin and the foundation of inequality among men, and it dates from 1755. And here the scene demarcates the moment when natural man is forced to leave the state of nature, where he, and it is mainly a he, is strolling around lonely in the woods. Yeah, that's the state of nature. Yeah, men are strolling around lonely in the woods, yeah? There's no social life whatsoever. Occasionally they are meeting females or whatever. Uh, we don't know exactly, yeah? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and thus being, you know, perfectly happy and self-content with what nature has to offer him. But suddenly, changes in nature force him to cooperate and to begin to socialize. And that is the moment when everything goes wrong. Men and women are now meeting outside the woods, gathering maybe around a tree, and trying to impress each other by more and more concealing their true selves, adopting roles, masquerades, imposing positions, and so on and so forth, and thus starting games of mutual recognition. This is when the degeneration of a species starts. And this degeneration increases inexorably until the deplorable state of affairs in Rousseau's own lifetime. And one could add even more so until today, as most, you know, theorists who consider themselves as being part of cultural critique would assume. So the second description of the same scene comes only three years later. It stems from the letter to D'Alembert about the theater from 1758. This letter is a response to D'Alembert's article, article on Geneva for the Encyclopedia, suggesting that Geneva should build a theater in order to calm down the rigid religious sentiments which have haunted the city since the days of Calvin's Reformation. So the theater was considered to be a civilatory yeah, mission, so to say. Uh, as a citoyen de Genève, Rousseau feels deeply provoked by that suggestion. Yeah? He didn't want to, you know, to be civilized. In, in order to defend his hometown's religious sentiments, petit bourgeois customs, and capitalist habits, he writes an engaged, enraged statement against the theater as such, which for very good reasons can be considered as the fundamental text of modern institutional critique. Within Rousseau's own trajectory, the letter to D'Alembert indicates the transition from the purely diagnost diagnostic ambition in cultural critique, which inspires the so-called first and the second discourse. The first discourse is uh, written in 1750, and he has this uh, inspirational you know, moment in the forest of Vincennes where he, he gets this idea that culture and civilization is not in progress but in decline. Yeah? So this is like a religious experience he has, and that's what the first discourse is about, and the second uh, you know, works out that as well, a manifesto of cultural critique. Um, so those two discourses are, you know, very diagnostical. They don't have, they have no therapy in it. Yeah? So, and in 1758, with the letter to D'Alembert, he makes the next step from diagnosis to therapy. Uh, and the therapeutic ambition, uh, which is evident in all his, his, of his major writings, mainly in the New Eloise, in Emile, in the Social Contract, uh, and some other writings. This shift from diagnosis to therapy, uh, within this shift, the scene we are talking about here changes its value fundamentally. So, Rousseau's critique of the theater is essentially a critique of a double representation. The political representation of the few speaking for all, that's one side, yeah, the political kind of yeah, representation, and the spectacular representation through images. Hmm? And he says, why should some of us meet in a dark space, each of them separated from one another, in order to watch terrible images of cruelty and oppression. Yeah? We could add here, you know, in a cold space or whatever. Yeah? It's, uh, it is what um, um, institutions uh, yeah, and theaters are uh, about. And he might have had some plays of Shakespeare in mind uh, or whatever. And he adds, uh, why do not all of us meet in the open air around a tree, such just acting out ourselves by dancing and sheer well-being? 
we can see here clearly how both representations can be challenged by the same act of communal gathering and performative self-exposure, where nothing is to be shown. And that's the point there, yeah? that's the decisive phrase of Rousseau, that nothing is to be shown, and that's what we see here, yeah? that's what this painting shows. To show nothing, therefore, represents the imaginary horizon of institutional critique. It refers to a state of things beyond representation and beyond critique, and as such, it implies an idea of embodied self-expression in individual and in collective terms. So the individual expression, yeah, uh, self-expression, self-exposure, is in the same time an articulation of a general will. Yeah? That's the big subject in his you know, political writings. Like the, the, uh, but that's what we also can see here, more or less. Yeah? It's not just individual expression, it's in the individual and the collective is the same, yeah? the same kind of authenticity which is deployed here. Um, so we can see here clearly how the express, expressive embodiment and institutional critique are structurally related towards, towards each other, however, not in the sense of an embodied critique, yeah, that's what we are supposed to talk about here, but in the sense of an embodiment which goes or aims beyond critique. Whereas in the second discourse, the dancing scene around the tree is this described as being all about showing, disguising, and masquerade. In the letter to D'Alembert, the same sa scene becomes um, the ideal state of things as close as possible to the natural state, because to that state there's no direct return possible. Yeah? So therapy cannot lead us into natural state again, where we are strolling around alone in the woods. Yeah? But there is a moment yeah, where we could aspire to return to, yeah? and that's the moment yeah, right after the natural state. Yeah? And the, the, mo the decisive moment is, uh, this, the, the decisive uh, aspect within that return is that we have to show nothing and to be, yeah, to be individuals and collectives at the same time. As an idea, this overcoming of institutions by sheer self-exposure is pushed forward also by the late Rousseau, especially in the Confessions, written between 1765 and 1770, published only in 1782. Here, right at the beginning, literally on the first page, he evokes the very idea of self-exposure of an outstanding individual. He's talking about himself as a means <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, as a means to perform acts of unquestionable authenticity, which essentially are supposed to free that individual, yeah, himself, from the opinions of others. Yeah? That's the crucial point. Yeah? Authenticity can only be gained if you reject the opinions of others. At the day of judgment, he says, he will present himself before the sovereign judge, yeah, God, with this book in his hands, and it will contain the whole truth of his life. There's nothing to be negotiated here. It is what it is. And the other fellow humans are not asked to articulate their views about him or their opinions about him and thus create some sort of public sphere yeah, of negotiations. Rather, they are asked to follow his example and to expose themselves with the same act of sincerity. That's the concept, yeah, the anti-bourgeois concept, yeah, that we are not creating a public sphere, but we you know, imitate yeah, and we mimic. Yeah? We all get undressed or cry when Andrea is doing that. Yeah? <laughs> At the same time, that's the concept. <laughs> mm. So the day of judgment has not come yet, and the revolution also did not succeed in terms of creating living conditions as close as possible to the natural state of things, for good or for bad. Probably for good, because the dancing scene, the republican ritual, contains a biopolitical fantasy which is far from being innocent. There are no foreigners included and no queers, 
men and women, young and old, have to stick to their roles. During the revolution, women were even killed just not for not sticking to their presumed natural roles. And obviously, there is, a, there is the crucial problem that the pure perf performative act of self-exposure would be completely meaningless if nobody would notice and appreciate it. Um, at least it, it is directed in, in Rousseau's own case to the so sovereign judge, yeah, to God, uh, so there is an implicit I yeah, watching that or proving that kind of authenticity. But that means that there is an intrinsic necessity to show this in the horizon of showing nothing. Rousseau was quite aware of contradictions like that. <coughs> he blamed his times for forcing him or one in general into contradictions. But that might be too easy an excuse. Maybe the contradiction is a structural one and therefore it represents the real challenge ever since. So if pure self-exposure is not possible and probably not even desirable, what then can be a perspective for institutional critique? Why and how should we then criticize representations and institutions? I think show, showing nothing still provides a sort of, you know, motivating horizon for critique, yeah? in many ways in contemporary art. But not in a naive way anymore. Self-exposure has become a widely shared cultural practice. It is not restricted to outstanding individual, individuals like Rousseau in his times or like several artists today. It has become an intrinsic element of pop and celebrity culture where indeed people follow or mimic each other in opening their hearts and bodies with a similar sincerity. Gestures, however, whose symbolic meaning is not understood anymore. I think in my memory, you know, the, the, the early rave scenes in the 1980s, early 90s, they still were aware, yeah, that there is a symbolic dimension in self-exposure, yeah, in individual and collective self-exposure. But precisely in mimicking that, you know, it just became, a, you know, whatever it became, yeah, where this, this horizon of, yeah, of a certain political meaning has been lost. Um, and that is why the pure gesture of self-exposure um, might not be enough. The real problem of the expressivist or expressionist tradition is precisely that it is, has not been aware of its own conventionality. This expressivist, I'm taking up a term by the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, he's... Uh, uh, using this term in order to describe the mainly German reception of Rousseau in early Romanticism, yeah, from Herder, Jacobi, Schlegel, those guys. Um, uh, and through that reception, this idea of that something has to be expressed, yeah, uh, uh, is stemming from and uh, made its career into what we then knew as the historical expressionism. Yeah? So that I, I would differentiate that. But again, it makes clear that, with, that this idea of expressionism yeah, that is related. It's not pure antagonism to, to institutional critique. There is a, there is a hidden connection. Yeah? That expressionism has a root yeah, it, within this expressivist tradition, which is you know, the, the horizon, which is the answer to the critique of institutions. Um, but obviously this is lost because uh, an expressionist painting is not aware yeah, of its own yeah, um, conventionality. Yeah? But it's using the medium of painting in a direct and way and claiming authenticity instead of uh, um, uh, referring to the highly conventional act uh, which uh, self-exposure has become since a long time. Um, so um, only if there is a reflexive element, yeah, uh, a way when the way of showing this in the showing expressive showing nothing is addressed, yeah, when the exhibitionary qualities are addressed, uh, uh, the contradiction between showing and showing nothing between representations and the performative assertion and critique can be grasped. 
the, these exhibitionary elements also imply a certain return of the social. And um, the exhibitionary spaces are essentially social spaces. And it also makes clear how anti-social um, uh, Rousseau's argument was. Yeah, I mean, he's really, he's, the social is the, you know, where everything evil in the world starts from. Um, and, uh, and that means that institutional critique is in need of some kind, uh, no, sorry, and again, institutions, yeah, if we are talking about social spaces here, uh, institutions are nothing else than social spaces. Yeah? I think this is this is very, very important. It's not the house. Yeah, it's the, the, the social space in general. Yeah, in what Andrea will refer to in, in the Bourdieuian theory. Um, so that means that institutional critique is in need of some kind of institu institutionality in itself, towards which it can only be critical in a very limited way. Its own institutionality works as a precondition of its <coughs> criticality. Only if we presume a certain social space, we can refer to it in a, to, uh, we can refer to in a somehow uncritical way, critique will become possible. If there's no transcendental horizon for critique whatsoever, um, in the sense of an uncontested area of authenticity or autonomy, the social spaces will become more and more important. And that means that every act of critique is in itself contestable. It can and might be criticized. Only within the realm of negotiations, a however rudimentary public sphere, the institution of critique, and I'm taking up Andrea's phrase here again, can enfold thus implying neither unquestionable moral nor canonical art, but ethics and aesthetics as specific forms of practice. This is a little bit dense, but I hope I can make this clearer now by the end of the talk. So self-exposure is, for example, very manifest in Andrea's work, but it is a kind of self-exposure which is related to the exhibitionary, the institutional, the showing, and the opinions of others. So there's no pure transgression taking place now outside of social and um, institutional space is envisioned. Quite on the contrary, it is precisely in terms of social difference, psychological entanglements, and cultural specificity that self-exposure becomes a medium, using different roles, positions, and masquerades as their material. Even nakedness here becomes a masquerade. Yeah? I'm referring here, obviously, to official welcome or to untitled. And it's all about coding and not about self-evidence. And that directs the ways through which embodiment can become critique. However, the question remains how ethics and aesthetics are related towards each other within this kind of idea of embodied critique. It is the term practice or praxis itself which comes into play here. If we talk of artistic practices, yeah, what do we mean actually by that? Yeah? In, is differentiated from simply art practices or yeah, art aesthetic practices, ethic practices. What does the you know, term practice actually mean here? And like the Rousseauan acts of pure self-exposure, the Marxist understanding of praxis, and that's the, the dominant uh, tradition uh, using the term practice, indicates already a solution for contradictions by pure action or execution. Yeah? That's in the famous uh, 11 thesis on Feuerbach, where Marx says, you know, the world has been interpreted enough, so we have to do something. Yeah? We have to uh, act practically. And it's in pri praxis itself we will change the world. Um, taking this s certainties yeah, that practice itself yeah, or self-exposure yeah, will change the world, um, not for granted, but more as a medium for a reflexive articulation, precisely the term practice could become interesting as a starting point for addressing 
one's own desires, f uh, I can pronounce that, fallibilities, yeah, or vulnerabilities, as well as one's own conditionality through privileged interests or capital of different sorts. So I think this is a crucial point in, instead of a self-exposure yeah, of authenticity, whereas here a possibility which uh, can, you know, were at, at rest on the one hand were, you know, one's weaknesses, so to say, were vulnerabilities, but also one privileges. Yeah? And I think both is necessary. Yeah? And that's precisely the, you know, the layer where the social and the psychological spheres uh, interfere. Um, understood that such practice would describe a form of an always already embodied action which would neither simply accept the uncontrollable desires, the dimensions of desire, social existence and privilege, nor finally overcome them. It would neither be enough to understand it as an everyday perfectly assimilated action nor as an Im imaginary act of transgression. Yeah? I think it's all about, you know, with neither nors, uh, they constitute the margin. Yeah? So it's practice is not, you know, assimilation, not what's going on anyway, yeah? but it's also not transgression yeah? of completely acting out in, you know, in, a, in, in a totally different way. Embodiment. Um, um, yeah, and, and precisely at such, in, within this margin, yeah, for example, between assimilation and transgression, practice can articulate itself as embodiment as well as, as critique. Yeah? I think that's, that's important, yeah, to refer to the possibilities under which you know, embodiment even can be considered yeah, critique. Embodiment remains anchored uh, within the social, psychological, and uh, cultural spheres and its differences. And critique um, might be considered the dimension which shows the materiality of the body precisely not as a self-evident yeah, materialist uh, quality, but as is symbolically coded, always already transformed and continuously transforming uh, category through further practice. It is the thin red line between everyday embodiment and artistic or political embodiment which opens up the potential for practice. And this again raises the question of its ethical and aesthetic dimensions. So to come to a conclusion, I will try to, uh, to uh, talk about this relationship of you know, ethical and aesthetic uh, elements of practice uh, very briefly, yeah, more on a general level again, but I think it's uh, also very crucial to understand the works like Andrea. So an ethical practice in this understanding can neither be a, a morale, yeah? a morale rooted in law, norm, or tradition because any moral act um, in this understanding would always, you know, if I claim, you know, I'm in a moral position and you are not, it's only possible to act morally uh, in an sort of unethical way, yeah? It always contains this, you know, element of uh, rejection, demarcation towards others, yeah? So to, be, to act purely m in a moral way according to laws, norms, tradition is, you know, is not ethical, yeah? Uh, it's more a problem than a solution, yeah? Um, so an ethical practice in that sense is not a morale, yeah? It's aware of that yeah, problem in uh, you know, acting morally. But it is also not only a simply a reflexive category for morale or ethics in general. That's what usually the distinction is if you go to Wikipedia. Yeah? Morale is morale, and ethics is a, you know, a philosophical discipline of reflection about morals. But I think this is not, not enough. Yeah? Um, I would say eth an ethical practice is another form of ethics, yeah? a specific ethical form which precisely includes elements of reflexivity. Yeah? 
which is not just according to certain standards of the law and or tradition, but you know it it contains certain aspects of, of reflexivity about its own procedures. And not only that, in order to be able to to even recognize itself as ethically, it has to negotiate different options and experiences. In the long run, that means uh, ethical practice has to act unethical in order to become ethical. And there's no final decision, yeah, if it's only ethical, yeah, or if it's maybe too much, yeah, it drifted too much into the unethical. There's no final decision in sight. Ethical practice in this sense can only be relativist and ambivalent in order to maintain the ethical ambition. Of course, it also needs an eth a direct ethical uh, element, but that is not enough, yeah? Um, so that implies that you have to expose yourself to the unethical or to even act unethically in order to become ethical. Not violence is here the problem because violence is a problem of, of morale. Yeah? Um, if, you, if something is not you know, following the rules of the law, of tradition, and so you have to implement uh, violence. Yeah? Um, so violence is not the problem of, of, the, of uh, ethical practice. Uh, uh, but the unethical. The unethical is the condition of possibility for the ethical in Derridaian terms, but in which form? Again, it is not the grand A moralism of the avant-garde, which try to tr transcend any form of ethics. It is way more specific. The form of the unethical could be the aesthetic, one of the forms, at least. So comparable to the distinction between ethics and morale, we could also differentiate in between art and aesthetics. In the sense that the difference does not lie in the opposition of praxis, practice versus reflexivity, uh, so that art is practice and aesthetics is the philosoph philosophical discipline of reflecting art or uh, aesthetic crit criteria, um, but that we have here as well, two different forms of practice. Art in this understanding would represent the canonical form, at least by trend, which is always confronted by the problem of a violence of its implementation. It always needs a violent act, acts of violence, implicit violence to implement itself as the canonical truth. Yeah? Um, Whereas aesthetic as practice is categorically rooted within the social institutional space which only allows its appearance. Therefore, it is not simply individual expression either. So practice can only become an aesthetically meaningful term if it implies the failure of canon and self-expression alike. It's again that to talk about aesthetic practice means neither to talk about the canon nor to talk about simple self-expression, yeah, so that everyone has to self-express him or herself. Like ethical practice, aesthetic pra practice cannot succeed. Mm. But there might be some success precisely in failure, especially if ethics and aesthetics are related to each other in terms of practice. In order not to become simply morale or art, in order neither to end up in pure subjectivism nor in a new form of normativity, an ad additional indeterminate moment is needed, a moment of the unethical within the ethical, a moment of the unesthetic within the aesthetic. The aesthetic could be understood as such as a moment of the unethical, which makes ethics possible, and the ethical as an aesthetic, unesthetic, which helps aesthetic to realize itself as practice. Within such a mutual conjuncture, the symbolic space of politics might open. So the ethics of institutional uh, critique necessarily refers to aesthetics, yeah? to the performative, conceptual, situational aesthetics yeah? of institutional critique. Uh, ethics and aesthetics mutually function as limits to one another. Um, in finally preventing institutional pr critique from becoming neither morale nor art. Yeah? And I think that's what we maybe could discuss 
in terms of Andrea's work. Yeah. Okay, that's it. So many thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.